This week, we welcome Alan Liska, the Senior Solutions Architect at our sponsor, Recorded Future, uh, to talk about catching up with the hype with threat intelligence. In the second interview, we welcome in Dave Marble. He's the president and CEO at Ocean, where I used to work, actually. So we'll get to learn about Ocean and what to expect at this year's Rhode Island Cybersecurity Exchange Day. In the security news, YouTube is in controversy pretty much on all fronts, and I'll put out a call to the hacker community uh, to help with this problem. Cisco Soho wireless VPNs and firewalls are open to attack. The ring doorbell flaw is opening, up, uh, opening us up to spying. Uh, bot uh, are plaguing certain networks. Uh, free hacking tools, everything you need to know about the Huawei controversy, and more, all on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul Security Weekly. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Organizations' internal networks are overly permissive and can't distinguish trusted from untrusted applications. Attackers abuse this condition to move lateral through networks bypassing address-based controls to spread malware. Edgewise abstracts security policies away from traditional network controls that rely on IP addresses, ports, and protocols, and instead ties controls directly to applications. Edgewise allows organizations to analyze the network attack surface and segment workloads based on the software and how it's communicating. Edgewise monitors applications and protects data paths using zero-trust segmentation. Visit edgewise.net forward slash security weekly to get your free month of visibility. Some restrictions apply. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to graphwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Your host to be, who is now debt free. Thank you, 10B. My friend and business partner, Paul Asadorian. I like how it, it rhymed. That was like a I, little, like, it was like a haiku. <laughs> that was I've, I've been working on that one for a couple for weeks because I thought I was going to have to do it last week. And right. So I had to delay it to this week. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome everyone to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode 596, recorded on February 28th, 2019 in G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. We've got all kinds of people on the lines via Zoom and Skype and, and in studio. To my left of, left, of course, I can't talk uh, for some reason. Whenever we start the show, <laughs> the martinis. probably because <laughs> I'm on my second martini because someone else is making him, them. And I'd like to thank our bartender and CEO, Mr. Matt Alderman. Thank you. Always great to be in studio. Well, I get this once a month, and I'm like, I'm here. And Dude, it's, it's like automatic fun. when you make like certain drinks. I, like they just magically show, show up. Show up, and they it's magically nice. just taste really good. And they magically disappear. <laughs> actually, yeah. <laughs> I, I get a lot of practice at home. Uh, my wife Lauren, she loves her cocktails, so I've perfected certain ones. And if I make them, I know how to make them, and I know how to make them well. That that's that's one one skill I have. And see, uh, your wife and I have a similar taste in cocktails, so it works out. Yeah, because, it does. Yeah, we like the same ones. It's good. It's good. Alan Lisk is here with us from Recorded Future. Alan, welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and Dave Marble is here from Ocean. How are you doing, Dave? Awesome. This is great. It's nice to have nice a bar and everything. This is we awesome. We have, uh, yes. <laughs> I um, Pretty early on when we started the, the show, I was like, you know, it's going to be a relaxed environment. And then I was afforded the luxury to make this my job. And I was like, well, you know, we're going to have a studio. It's going to have a bar. It's going to be a relaxed atmosphere. Uh, many of our employees work on the couch next door. Yeah. So we try and, you know, maintain that, uh, that same kind of uh, environment and culture that started the show where we're just, you know, a bunch of people getting together to talk about security. So It's always fun when I have to put the 
financial plan together to figure out what the right budget for alcohol, cigars, and other accoutrements are. <laughs> There's a lot of creative accounting here at Security Weekly. <laughs> if you're listening, IRS, close your ears. <laughs> uh, and Al, too, our CPA. Yes, exactly. Al, do not listen to do this Do not listen. <laughs> uh, on the lines, remotely, Mr. Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. Lee, I think you're muted. Hello. <laughs> just push Technology. it once. It's just what it's binary. It's <laughs> binary. <laughs> <late>. Just once. <laughs> just once. The Yeti will there respond. <laughs> there he is. Um, great to great to be here from Idaho. We're uh, obviously having trouble with the binary, but other than that, we're ready to go. Got the part Charlotte on hand. We're we're all set. Now, Lee, I I know you wanted to talk about thunderclap, and we will talk about that this week. And I I still maintain it. it sounds like some kind of really strange venereal disease but yes. it's not it has to do with thunderbolt it's a bad name i mean in terms of naming exploits Horrible. it's pretty bad it's pretty I, bad. I like jeff's response though <laughs> scotch and cigars scotch and cigars <laughs> yeah uh also on the lines remotely mr joff thire is here with us joff welcome Hey, good. I was really good to uh good to be here again uh good good to hear that your wives also like cock tails and Thunder thanks Clap. for that, Joff. <laughs> thanks for that Your colorful welcome. commentary. <laughs> As always, uh, Joff and I, it, it, it's interesting. I think people think that all of the Security Weekly hosts and, and everyone gets to talk like all the time and hang out. Usually when we get together to the, for the show, that's when we have the opportunity to talk. So we're late because Joff mm -hmm. and Alan and I mostly were discussing DNS issues as it relates to security. So maybe we'll... It's all in the timing. It's just I, I, I feel like if we start talking about that later, it, the show's going to go even longer than we already have scheduled. <laughs> so we will save that for a special segment or two. Uh, also, Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Happy to be here as always, Paul. Now, Jeff, are you going to be at RSA next week? I will, in fact, be at RSA. And uh, I don't have news on our uh, wiki this week, but I did put up... Uh, a couple little extracurricular events that I'll be doing. One is uh, something to do with the uh, Tribe of Hackers. They're having a, a book signing uh, and Tribe of Hackers panel discussion on, I believe, Tuesday evening. Uh, and it's in association with Mach 37 and CIT. I believe uh, Threat Care, which is Marcus's company, mm. is a Mach 37 graduate, mm. if that's, that's what you call it. I think so. I'm and, not sure. Uh, I'm also Peerlist, uh, who I have uh, blogged for occasionally. I don't know if anybody else is on Peerlist. They put together an afternoon of free trainings, and they asked me to to uh, give a little uh, training workshop on the Art of the Jedi Mind trick. So I'm going to do that. Nice. And other than that, I'm going to be just going from party to party to party. Tonga, ta when is TongaCon? Sunday. Night. Sunday. 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 Are we, Sunday. Are we going to that? Yeah. I know. I just, whatever Matt and Sam says, I have to go to at RSA. That's if, just if I had to bring to up my screen for the schedule we have at RSA, people would be like, "Are you crazy?" I mean, it, literally, because we're recording broadcast alley on Monday and Tuesday. I mean, literally, every half an hour slot through lunch all the way through Tuesday is like sixteen hours straight. I, I, I kid you not. It just crazy, crazy. Just schedule. text me where I need to be. Yep. I'll be there. It's on your calendar. You just got to look. You still may need to text me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we just released our 2019 Security Weekly 25 Index Survey. Please go to securityweekly.com and click the survey link to help us understand who's evaluating, using, or formerly used any of the Security Weekly 25 companies. If you're wondering what the Security Weekly 25 companies are, they are publicly traded security companies that Matt has chosen as an in, a stock index, yeah, essentially. Stock index, yeah. uh, that we we compare that typically to the Nasdaq and other. We have lots of fun with it. We actually. do. We do a quarterly show on Business Security Weekly where we kind of review. I call it the Security Money segment, where we kind of check the index, see how it's performing uh, against the Nasdaq, primarily since most of these are, are tech stocks, um, a subset of tech stocks. But we also talk about funding and. 
uh, acquisitions, mm. other activities. And so we do that once a quarter and we created an index just so we can kind of track how our industry, the, the top 25 public companies yeah. are doing. See, I realized with the stock market, if I had a time machine, I'd make a lot of money in the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> However, I don't. So I see things like we covered, you know, Okta was like 149% uh, on the uptick in the a year, year. Yeah, in the year. year, I'm like, we totally should have bought that. <laughs> yeah. That's totally. like that's not how it works, Paul. Like you don't get to go back in time. <laughs> like that was a good stock if you knew about it a year ago. Hey, you uh, know, Paul, I, I got to throw in a comment there. There is actually a security ETF called Hack, which is a pretty good one. It probably fairly closely resembles the uh, index that you guys have assumed. Mm. It does. The, the problem with Hack, I'll just give you a little background on why I created our own index. Hack includes some of the non-pure play public companies. And it I does. wanted a pure play on security. So like Cisco's not in my index because... Yeah, Cisco does security, but they, a, a ton of their revenue comes from networking the other side. And there's other companies like that that have this kind of dual personality with security. I wanted to find just a pure play security guys so I could see how the core market was doing and not get shadowed by some of the ancillary services some of these other companies provided. That, I, is, an I, excellent, I agree. that is an excellent response, Matt. Um, I was just... Uh, I was just thinking about that because um, some of us may have some money in some of these companies, which is not a bad idea. Yeah. So listen to my show quarterly on BSW, and I'll give you all the updates. There you, there you go. go. There you go. Uh, now, so if you're going to participate in the survey, uh, you will gain access to a private webcast uh, that we will be presenting for everyone who fills out the survey. So uh, another announcement. Oh, this is a big one. I've been waiting for this for like so many years and finally I was like I got everything I'm like Matt just in team go make it happen now like I'm just go we, we're going to announce it tonight and they were like okay so finally the security weekly guest request form is live this is huge this is the first time we've ever had a public and official way for our security weekly listeners or if you work for <laughs> high cousin Rachel for a PR company or in public re relations you can come to our site now and fill out a form, and there's a formal process for us to review them. Now, I can't promise you that every guest you suggest uh, will be on the show, because we've had some crazy suggestions over the years. I'm not quite sure that all of them are going to make the list. However, if you would like to suggest a guest for the show, it's very simple. You go to securityweekly.com forward slash guests. You fill out a very simple form. Give us as much information about the guest as you can. And then basically we, we vote, we approve, uh, yay or nay. Uh, and, and I will caution people that there's a, a couple of, of rules for guests on the show. Uh, you know, one is the rule that kind of got us started in the security industry. And that is if you have a project of any kind, open source software, uh, guideline, documentation, block, whatever it is, if you have something that is free and available to the security community and benefits the security community at large, you're always welcome to come on the show and talk about that. So that's, that's the, if you work for a security vendor, there's no charge. You come on, you can talk about it. It's totally fine. We've done that a lot in the past. Um, if you do work for a security vendor, you more than likely will qualify for a paid interview, which is totally fine. We want to work with you on that. Find the right show, the right topic. Um, and if you don't work for a security vendor and you have something to share, it's... You know, it's pretty easy. We have people from the community that come on the show all the time. Those are the basic kind of rules as to what you can expect when you fill out the form. So, alrighty, Alan uh, has been very patient, as has everyone else, because we're a little it took a long time to get started on the show today. Uh, but it, it's it's going to be an awesome show. It's a lot of fun, and Alan Liska is here with us. Uh, Alan, welcome to the show, and uh, give us a little bit about your background, like how you got started in security uh, and share with our listeners kind of your, your journey to, that brought you here. Sure. So um, I was a sociology major in college, um, and I went to go work for our survey research center. Um, and they made me the networking guy because I was the only one willing to crawl under the desks to plug the wires sure. in. Um, and that led to a job where... Wait, are you saying, like me, you spent a lot of time under desks? Exactly. Yes. Not necessarily how we got here, right. but required that... <laughs> on it, your knees. Right. On my knees, under, under desks. desks. You exactly. Do, you yeah. do, though, when you yes. work in the help desk. And, yeah. yeah. 
And so uh, from there, I went to go work for a company called Genie Online Services. It was mm-hmm. an early competitor to AOL. So that's how old I am. Um, and I left there to go work for UUNet um, back when ah. UUNet was mm-hmm. cool before all of the acquisitions sure. and so on. Um, Which and, also dates you. that you've, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, I did that for about six years. Uh, and then uh, WorldCom came along and I got laid off with 17,000 of my closest friends. Wow. And while I was there at UUNet, I had gone from doing networking, building the NOC, to working in our uh, data center, c- configuring firewalls and so on. And a good friend of mine, when I got laid off, said, oh, hey, um, I'm going to work for this company uh, that is now part of a, that's now part of a Symantec, the Symantec MSSP service. Why don't you come uh, work with me? And I'm like, sure. And so then I became a security engineer. Um, I did that for a few years. Uh, didn't like working for a big company, so I went to go work for a small government contractor for 10 years, which then got acquired by Boeing. Um, so I didn't like working for a big company. Sure. Went back to Symantec for a little bit. Then I went to, uh, and started working really in threat Intel, um, uh, with Symantec's deep Sight, mm-hmm. uh, software. And cause I'd been doing Intel for the government contractor that I was working for. And, and it was nice to see what Intel was looking like. It was very nascent at that time. Uh, uh, just getting started in the private sector. Um, I left to go work for a small company called iSight Partners, which then got acquired by FireEye. Didn't like working for a larger company, so um, I went to <laughs> Recorded just, Future. There's a theme, it's, it's, there's a theme there. Yes. Yeah. There's a theme there. <laughs> yes. The company but, you're going to work for is going to get acquired at some point. Right. right. I, that's actually my, that's actually my uh, when I go work for a new company and mm-hmm. I submit my resume, if you hire me, you're going to get acquired by a bigger company. Um, right, right. So, um, so and, and that's kind we'll of what you're doing. We'll see if your streak so holds true with Recorded Future. Then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was Rip Tech. Tech yeah, 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 you know that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Most well, people don't. I mean, Euron and yeah. the Euron brothers? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, working above a furniture store before we moved to our uh, office in Alexandria, it was, it was an amazing experience, like really getting and trying to build out how do you correlate. And I know you're going to be- find this hard to believe. We were getting almost 100,000 logs a day from all of our customers <laughs> way back then. Ooh, uh, almost 100,000 logs. I know. Logs. It was crazy. <laughs> Um, it was kilobytes of data. Ex- exactly. It was it was awful. I, I mean, think I got that in a couple of hours just from my DNS servers. Right. This today. morning. Right. <laughs> today. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, no, it was growing that and growing that experience was, was, it's was funny, amazing. It's funny, Ellen, your background doesn't surprise me. We were talking about DNS earlier. Mm-hmm. I feel like most of the security people kind of just like inherited DNS. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Whenever I, I hear people speak and they're talking about DNS, I'm like, You've likely been working in security for the past 20 years or so because we were, I think, 20 years ago trying to be as well-rounded as possible, understand all the stuff we understood DNS. And, like, no one but the security people really want to touch DNS, I found, in my career. Like, every job that I had, I was the DNS security expert. It sounds like you had similar experiences across your career yeah i actually wrote a book on dns security um, oh, really so uh yeah um yeah uh, your your name in you look familiar like we've definitely crossed paths and it's a it, short yeah. book <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> um yeah no it, it, you're, you're absolutely right it's one of those things where I, you know i feel like now my job is to specialize in obscure protocols yeah um you know because i also wrote a book about ntp um sure and, and I've always thought for your intro um, that you should add the line uh, "fingers aren't the or servers aren't the only thing getting fingered," but I have a feeling that that would lose most of your audience. It would be lost. Right. It would be lost. Um, Yeah. I was explaining that protocol to one of our young analysts, and he's like, "Wait, what? You could just finger a server?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," and and get information about the server. And he's like, "That's a real protocol." it's real protocol. It's a real protocol. There are probably some servers out there that still have it open. Um, and now, what port did it run on? That was. It was a slow trivia. UDP. Um, I think seventy nine, but I'm not positive. Oh, it was lower than that. Was it? Was it? I I think it was like under twenty. Anybody have Google on them? To the Google. Oh, yeah, here we go. To the Google's. Uh, port seventy nine. It is seventy nine. It is seventy nine. 
Very good. There you go. Yeah. Very good. Yep. So, um, yeah, w- when I worked at UUNet, we had uh, all Solaris boxes. Yeah. And, and so we would do things like that. Uh, Wait, uh, what year did you have all Solaris boxes? Uh, 96. Okay, so 96, a little before I worked, I worked with Solaris in early yeah. 2000s. Yeah. So the first, the first uh, desktop, the Workstation 2 that I had, still had a black and white monitor. Um, wow. And, and what That's we awesome. would do is convince the new people, figure out how to convince the new people to turn Xhost Plus on so that we could mess with <laughs> them <laughs> mercilessly um mm-hmm. things that you definitely could not do now um uh uh you know we would uh they, they'd be on a really intense call and we'd melt their screen and sure. uh send uh things flying across it and and so on until they figured out oh i should probably turn that off <laughs> that's awesome that's great hazing <laughs> um so uh what oh we were supposed to talk about threat intelligence oh right? yeah i guess we should do that <laughs> we should probably talk about threat intelligence <laughs> um, we should probably talk about what we were going to talk about uh, yeah right <laughs> like dude, so we're just you know having a good good old grand old time here uh i i think there's a lot of um it, it's interesting we're actually on a call earlier and we're talking about how some look at the threat intelligence in a completely backwards manner right and i, I think that's a really good way to frame it they look at it as well, I got all these threat intelligence feeds and therefore I get all this data and now I have a lot more work because I have to go through all this data and I have to correlate it and I have to figure out like exactly what it means and do all this work. And really the correct, in my opinion, usage of threat intelligence data is to flip it around and say, well, that's a source that should help you, not make you do more work, right? And so I think because of that, threat intelligence has gotten a bad name largely because if we go back in history right we did have threat intelligence we just called it blacklists right that was the first threat intelligence but it's morphed so and grown up so much uh since the very early days of mail relays and the requirement to blacklist them right right well i'd go even further back than that i mean uh Technically, I think the first place where we bought in threat intelligence, even though we didn't call it that, was with vulnerability data. Yeah, you know, you'd bring in a feed from NVD or MITRE or, or wherever and check that against your systems to see if you had anything that needed to be patched. That's a form of threat intelligence. And sure. you know, I was doing that 25, 20, 20 some years ago. Yeah, um, when, when was the first CV? 96? 90, I think. I think 96, 97, something like yeah, that. Yeah, so it's, it, it's obviously been going on for a while. Um, uh, but I, I think to your point, though, and, and hopefully our CEO isn't listening, um, you know, there are still a lot of people that aren't ready for threat intelligence because in order to effectively use threat intelligence, you have to know what you have in your organization. Right. right? Just bringing in a feed, bringing in a, 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 a you know, set of threat intel that you can't match up against what's happening in your network means you don't have that context and you can't do anything actionable with it. If, if it, your threat intelligence isn't contextual, contextual and actionable, it's really not doing you any good. I, and I think that's where the original threat intelligence issues began. Mm-hmm. Is It was a data source, but it really wasn't actionable because I couldn't get that context or actionability out of it, right? Threat well, I had the same problem with, uh, well, I guess you could consider it a threat and tell feed. It did have some threat and is snort, right? Yep. Yeah. You'd see an IDS alert that said you had some Solaris vulnerability or some you know, condition in Solaris. And your first question was, do I have Solaris in my environment? And the second question is, that alert, the source or destination IP address, whichever end it was on in my network, is that host Solaris. <laughs> I think we spent a lot of time investigating alerts just really around, like, do I have that in my network? And if I do, is it that thing that was involved with that event? Yeah, so if we go back, like, even four or five years ago, when threat intelligence was kind of the big thing, I think the challenge for everybody was, well, how many feeds are enough? Right. Right. And, and you started seeing all people buying all these different feeds, but then they weren't doing anything with the data right. it, because they couldn't create any of that context. And what started to evolve now, which I think is is kind of where you're going with this, is if I do, if I can't correlate it to something known, then I can't take an action off of it. And if I can't do that, then it's not worthwhile of just ingesting a bunch of threat data sources for the sake of ingesting threat data sources. Right, exactly. Otherwise, you've got a a bunch of useless information. Not 
to call out any of, of, of our competitors, but you know, uh, if, if all you're getting out of your threat intel provider is a cool pew pew map, then it's not actually helping you. I mean, it looks great on the sock wall, but it doesn't actually help with anything. Yeah, I don't think they exist anymore. Do they, they don't. Yeah, right. Which is why it's probably okay for me to call out. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's when we saw the kind of the, the the kind of the high point of threat intelligence, and then the big implosion, right. and then the reinvention <laughs> of threat intelligence. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think the reinvention was the intelligence piece of the term, right? Because it, <laughs> it, 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 and, and, well, I, I said it in all no, seriousness because I, I think there was a lot of feeds you were subscribing to, and the data was not all that useful in that like to give an example you know joff and i did a lot of segments actually on dns blacklisting and what i found over time was that it would block a lot of legitimate stuff because it didn't have the intelligence to know or and i didn't have the right systems to make usage of that data so it would block legitimate <coughs> stuff we had that problem with mail exchangers back right. in the day we we're like why can't i, I send email oh it ended up on a blacklist guess what Joff, this happened to you when you worked at university. It had to. Your mail server oh, ends absolutely. up on a blacklist, and then uh, all of a sudden it gets released, and then like there's a few people in some other university or wherever that didn't update their blacklist, and you can't send email. And that's, uh, I think, another reason why we had this kind of negative reaction to threat intelligence as it was emerging in the re-emerging in the market in this new intelligent sector right. is we had been burned by it. And it's, it takes time... I think for security professionals to get over the things we've been burned by and learn the new that it can be effective that we've come a long way. Yeah, absolutely. I think the big, I think the big thing was local context. I mean, yeah. we had, you know, we had threat intelligence and 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 we make this assumption in the in the industry that that all of the problems out there tend to be common to everybody and you know, for a very large proportion of the problems that is correct. However, there's always a local interpretation, a local read, and a local context that has to be taken into account. And I think threat intelligence was lacking that in its first iteration. But in subsequent iterations, it, they started to learn that we need a way for people to contextualize this uh, for, from a local environment perspective. And I think that you know then gives you a much more successful result. And I just realized my, my cat is in the screenshot off, <laughs> off, off my left shoulder. It was really funny. It's, but, but anyway. Lurking uh, behind you. Yes, there is a yeah, cat. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's where I think we failed. And then subsequently, I think, uh, succeeded because I think everybody got the idea that we need to put the control back in the hands of the the people that have the local context and local priorities. Right. And I think it also helps that security vendors have gotten better about opening their platforms to mm. allow you to import threat intelligence. You know, the idea of being able to bring in third party data to a Symantec product or a McAfee product or a FireEye product four years ago was just anathema to their business model. But now they realize that, oh, okay, we need to allow this third party data in because they want to be the center console. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, that's where we want to be. If that's what the SOC analyst or the security person's using, then we want our intelligence there because that gives them that local context, makes it actionable, and they're not ingesting things that aren't relevant to their network or their organization. Yeah, I think that was one of the challenges is without allowing that data from other sources to come in, you were losing the, the single console battle, right? right? Now we had all these point solutions all over the place. Everybody wants to be the single pane of glass in the sock, right? right? Only certain systems have the ability to be the single pane of glass, but that also means you have to be much more open to allowing data in, data out. Right. And that's what's, I think, transformed well, over the past few the years. The integration solved a, a very uh, interesting problem and unique problem to threat intelligence in that traditional like older threat intelligence feeds were definitely and even still today it's about what's happening on other people's networks not what's happening on your network through integrations rather than a lot of work and customization now through integrations that are much easier you can take what's going on on other people's networks and see if it's happening on your network and the icing on the cake is correlate that with other events and present the SOC analyst with something that is potentially highly likely to elicit some type of action or response. 
yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And you know, and even though we've done a much better job of integration, you still, when you walk into a SOC, you still see 30 tabs open on everybody's desktop. Yes. So we're not right. there yet. We still have a long way to go, but we're getting better. And I think that helps. Yes. As does, uh, I've been using your new browser plugin. Yes. Which is awesome. The, so the, I want you to tell our audience about that because I, I think it's pretty cool. I've been using, uh, and we're doing a webcast. Uh, I think we have a date for it. It's the after. 26th, March, March 26th. March 26th, yeah. And so I'm using a lot of open source tools. You know, we're a small operation. Um, so we're very, and I like to play around with a lot of security technologies uh, without, you know, having a huge enterprise network. A lot of what I'm playing around with is open source. But I've got a lot of, you know, web pages and other things that come across in, in IP addresses and domain names. And now I right click on them and I can check to see in the recorded future database if you've got intelligence or any kind of information about that IP address or domain. It's right. pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, and to me that is, uh, you know, I think there needs to be more of that type of thing because basically it gives you an instant integration. It's And, and I, I do all kinds of research all the time and, and I use that in, in, in sort of my daily routine so I don't have to go to our portal. Okay, right. hey, I'm looking at this you know, thing on Pastebin or I'm looking at this thing on a dark web forum. Is that something that, oh, hey, yeah, we do have some information on that. Great. Now I can get that that data. You know, being able to see not just IPs and domains, but CVEs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, malware types, uh, and, and file hashes, and, and instantly correlate that with whatever's in your screen is a really powerful capability. Because now in those 30 browsers, you have our integration. Even if there isn't a productized integration, you have our integration built right into it. And it also makes it more accessible for more organizations. You know, if, if you're a, a large bank, it's easy. You have a whole team that can help out with integrations or you can hire professional services and bring them in and build that. But if you're a smaller organization, if you're a team of three or four or five, you don't have the time to really build that out. Now it's, that in integration's done for you. Well, in the financial space, you have FSISAC and the sharing right. side too. So you're also yeah. sharing with your peers you know, which is probably the most successful, yeah. you know, sharing program we've seen. Yes. We've seen others try to replicate it, but not nearly to the extent that FS ISAC has done. So if you're in the financials, there's a lot of sharing, but you're right. If you're in another industry where you don't have that same type of capability, you're kind of left on your own. This is a nice way to augment aspects of that pretty effectively, I think, versus, um, you know, having some of the other capabilities that you might need. But you're right, though. It's interesting, and it, you've taken me back to uh, something I hadn't considered in this context, is that in the early days of my security training, like when I was at SANS, for example, uh, training at SANS, and you know, they say, well, when you see an IP address as an example, you need to investigate what, what it is, right? So you do a you know, reverse lookup on the IP address, you do a who is lookup on the IP address, you go to this other site to see... If it's ever been blacklisted, you go to Virus Total maybe to see if it's associated with any CNC or embedded in any malware, right? And there's this like whole chain of tools, right, that you that you would go through. And you fast forward to today, and you wish that you had the things you had today back in the day, right? Because now all of that information is really highly automated through a lot of different ways. Your right. Recorded Futures browser plugin is just one of them, which is great. Right, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I, again, I'm dating myself, but I had Perl scripts that yes, I had. Yes, we on all my, scripted it, right? Right, yes. right. That you know, okay, hey, this IP address I need to look at. It's going to hit all these databases and produce something, but that's in a terminal window, not in the window that I'm necessarily looking right. at. So I'm jumping from window to window to do it, copying where, and pasting in between. It's, yeah, right. Yep. And now with Recorded Future, you can pull all that information in. Plus. We'll do things like we have uh, for IP addresses. We have bad neighborhood. So, hey, this, this IP address, we don't have anything on it. But there's 10 other IP addresses in that slash 24 mm -hmm. that, that have been bad in the last couple of months. Maybe there's something going on here. So you might, you know, you may be the, the sort of the canary of m the next generation of malicious activity happening from this IP range. Right. Mm -hmm. Because those devices are coming up and down all the time. They're switching IP addresses exactly. to try to keep you off. And so if they're coming from that same subnet, it, it potentially is malicious. Right. If other malicious activities on that same subnet. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I, I, I like 
to uh, they'll never they don't ever let me do this, but I like writing about the the bad guy failures, like bad guy upset failures, because mm-hmm. there's a whole lot of it. And what I think people don't realize, because we and and we as vendors, I think do a disservice sometimes, because we always talk about the scary bad guy um, that you can't possibly defend against. But most bad guys are fairly incompetent, and most of them, even the competent ones, are fairly lazy. Mm-hmm. So they like to reuse infrastructure. Hey, you know this this university or this data center or whatever that I was able to compromise i'm just going to go back and go and compromise more servers in there because i know they have low level security so you know i got these 10 i'm going to go get these 10 next and now that's my new infrastructure because why would i bother scanning and trying to find new targets to acquire and redirect through and so on when i know this is right here and that's that's going to work for me well that's part of the economics for the hacker right right? if if i know the, the the lowest point of weakness and i've already infiltrated the environment, I'll just do it again and go grab a few more hosts because they patched the other ones and I'll do it all over again. It, it's really low cost to them to have to do that. It, right. The economics are there for them. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think that speaks to uh, the challenge we have of taking an asset inventory of all of the systems, software, applications, protocols, and infrastructure that we have. And that when if we do have an incident and everyone does, whether you know it or not, and you think you've gone and fixed it, getting to that root cause is one thing. Finding the root cause or exposure and fixing across your entire environment, and then from vulnerability management, making sure that that stays you know, fixed <laughs> right. for time is also a challenge. And Show I think me, that's why, I, as an attacker, I would also revisit the same network, yeah. knowing that all of that is really yeah. hard. Show me that all the other systems look like this one are also yeah. patched to the same level. Otherwise, I know they're vulnerable, and so my scripts, without any changes, will not work. Mm-hmm. Right. And the next time you provision a new server, right. are you provisioning from an old image that you're now going right. to republish that vulnerability? Thank you, golden image. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and then, of course, the, all the things you didn't know about. You know, somebody in marketing goes out and you know, takes the corporate card and buys a server somewhere because they want to set up a website with a contest. And you know, their system's vulnerable, and you're responsible for it even though you had no idea it existed. Yeah, the level yeah, of shadow IT A lot IT of problem. people think of shadow IT as mostly IoT devices or mobile devices, but I've personally had very successful pen tests and it was because exactly what you said, the marketing team actually spun up a website and it was horribly vulnerable. And then, you know, I also think that people think, well, you know, how, how far could you get with that? It, it, it's pretty far. Like an attacker just needs a very small kind of inlet into the, your network and environment. And once you start pivoting from there, that initial foothold you can go pretty quickly to getting some serious yeah, damage. Once so I've you actually have, done that. Before. Once you have yeah. root only, on a box, it's... Mm-hmm. Yeah. If only there was like some sort of compliance standard that would require companies <laughs> to keep track of their... <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> wait, wait. He didn't say it yet. I didn't say it yet. <laughs> wait for it. Wait is for it. it. Wait for Jeff, it. Wait, wait for is it. Is it HIPAA? Is it no. Graham Leach Bliley? No. The NIST no. Sorry, no. Is it framework? Is it... No. No. Uh, for although, the, uh, NIS, although the NIST cybersecurity framework is based on it. Oh, oh. oh interesting. Mm. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Graham right. Leach Bliley is what Jeff is referring to. No. It rhymes with GM, PCI. Yeah, here we go. It, it rhymes. rhymes with PCI. It rhymes with PCI. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to drink twice. Drink. <laughs> we all need to take a shot. Mm hmm. Hopefully a, a sip is okay, since I don't really want to do a shot of wine. wine. No, yes, that's probably yes, a good idea. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. uh, I will sip. Every time, every time Jeff says all, PCI, all, we drink. In all seriousness, though, I mean, this we're talking like this is an ongoing endemic problem, which it is, obviously. Uh, but it was a problem back in the beginning, 20, 25 years ago. Why haven't more companies changed their behaviors to prevent marketing departments from or or back in my day it was more developers just throwing up systems out on the web i I can't imagine that that's not happening now in cloud and containers it does you want to you want to know why i know why because tell me why because security is not embedded in the business right the biggest challenge that i see for our industry is we don't really understand what the business needs are and how to enable them securely And so when we say, no, you can't do that, they're going to be like, well, I got a credit card. I'm going to go do it myself. And and they go around security. 
And so we're not in the loop, which is why this is still kind of an You'll hear me problem. talk about so that in, in our YouTube discussions, the same thing. A lot of people are turning off YouTube in their homes because of all the things that are happening with YouTube. Mm. At least with my kids, that doesn't work. Right. <laughs> like my kids, and I'm yeah, sure a yeah, lot of us are in security, right? Your children, <laughs> they know how to get around yeah. those things. And especially <laughs> if it's something that you don't want them to do, it makes them want to do it even more. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing when you tell marketing, no, you can't have a website for another 60 or 90 days because we have to provision it, provision all the VMs and do all the stuff. And they're just like, I can't wait. I got to just I I gotta go, go. I, I uh, go somewhere I, else. I can it. give you a great in, a, ahead, example Dave. from from our markets, right? Is the university systems, right? Because the researchers get their own uh, National Science Foundation grants to do their research and their science, right? And they, you know, hate firewalls, right? Mm -hmm. Because it slows down their data transfers, right? <laughs> so they go off and they go around mm -hmm. IT. They go around everything that even smells like security because they don't want to slow down these data flows that they're trying to put do, and they have the power because they're getting their own money to do their own network, right? right. Which yep. is really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and usually I'd be talking to those folks, and I'd be like, you're getting what? You're like, oh, yeah, we're good, we're doing it. And then when they get hacked, they'd call me. Yeah. Like, Paul, can you come help me? Absolutely. <laughs> Going to come oh, help man. you. It's my job. Going to come help you. <laughs> I so remember those days, Paul. Right, and right, Josh? I was the same way in EDU, and I don't miss it one bit. <laughs> 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 I actually do miss it. But uh, if you could find... No, but, uh, hold on. On the flip side of that, I do miss it because it was a unique opportunity to see some really unique attacks uh, and yeah. also work with really smart people. I mean... They security gets in their way to Dave's point, right? But in their own respect, I learned so much from the people I worked with at Brown. Very but smart. People. If you worked with the researchers and came up with a uh, a really streamlined solution that would give them a layer of protection, so that's so that's what we're doing, right? It it is changing. It's changing dramatically, and a number of the firewall vendors and Juniper actually ha happens to be one of them that uh, is doing these elephant flow uh, scenarios where they treat the elephant flows as a trusted you know, uh, flow, mm -hmm. and they use the mice flows that go everywhere else down below, and they, they do the more heavy firewall s scenario on that, and they do the really light touch on the elephant flow that's through a, a trusted that's source. So they're starting to to change their, their equipment to, mm -hmm. to so that IT can now talk to to the researchers and actually get involved. Yeah, because if you could <laughs> give them a, a really, give them a, uh, give them a solution that works, and, and they trust it, then at least you're giving them a layer of security, maybe not to the extent that you would like, but at least it's better than just wide open data flows. Right. And it's interesting, and we're seeing that right it. down to the open source level too. Um, and I don't remember this in early, early, early firewalls. Uh, I mean, maybe for troubleshooting you'd do it, but you can actually turn off state tracking in, in, in a lot of firewalls. Even in the open source firewalls today, you can just disable that. That's a <laughs> use case where I could I could see all that. The, all the early firewalls didn't have state. Right? This is true. <laughs> this is true. When I say early firewalls, I meant checkpoint firewall one. Firewall one. one. Firewall yeah. one was state. Firewall one. That was the one. That was the one. Yeah. Um, I have a presentation that I give on DNS security and uh, DNS security at the registrar, and that's actually one of the pieces of advice I give. I say, look, you know, you need to do things like enable two-factor authentication for your registrar, and then whatever that policy is, you need to communicate communicate that out to everybody along with a list of registrars. So I'm not saying that security should be in charge of DNS registration, but I'm saying that here are the acceptable registrations and here's what you need to do in order to register a domain name and that way everybody knows what it is. So even if they don't come back and tell you about the dom new domain they registered as they should, um, at least you know that they've put in the, uh, an acceptable level of security practices. And I think security needs to be able to do more of that, communicate out, a as you say, to be part of the business process. Look, we know you guys need to do this, and we know you need to be re react fast to this. Here are the standards that you need mm -hmm. to meet when you're provi you know, provisioning new systems, registering a new domain, whatever it is. And then please let us know so that we can add it into our monitoring um, yeah, right. <laughs> systems. Because if we find yeah. out about it other ways... We're going to have a talk. If we'd mm -hmm. rather not talk to us, just let us know ahead of time, and that way we'll add it to our monitoring. Or at least provide a, a right. number of service providers that you know yeah. will provide a layer of security and say, look, pick one of the, these five. Right. And if you pick one of these five, I don't have a problem, and then eventually you, you'll pick it up. But it, that's the dialogue that doesn't happen enough right. in our industry, and that's why I see shadow IT and all these things happening because people are like, you said no. I put up the wall, 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to go around the wall. And that's what they do. Yeah. Well, it, it might be implied, but you know, the problem isn't them, it's us. Right. Yeah, well, we don't yeah. we we don't know how to have that conversation I, with our customers you're right. and with our 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 user community. Right. Well, it's you're, that and we're true. not invited to the table a lot. Security doesn't always um because they're not part of the business process, they don't they're they're not there to even have that discussion. But definitely there's been a mindset and I I think it's starting to change of saying no to everything because everything could be a security breach. So naturally we can't allow anything, which of course is a ridiculous posture to take. Um, Rather than being the department of no, you really have to be the department of, okay, here's how you can do that. Yes, here's how you can do it. Or here's the things you can do. And that is the dialogue that we just have to continue to work through on our side. it's that, and it, and it, but it's also a little of, and this to me is what you know, risk management is all about. It's, it's getting all the facts, laying them all out. The, there is no perfect solution. There's pros and cons to everything. And I, you know, as a as a consultant advisor, I don't really care what the customer does, as long as they're making an informed decision, and and they know if they go with option. B, uh, this is what they're risking. This is what the trade-off is. But if they want to go with C, uh, they might be getting a little bit more, you know, functionality, but they're giving up a little bit of security. It might cost more. It might cost less. To me, it's all about uh, educating our, our, our customers, if you will, and, and, and making sure that they're making informed decisions. Yeah, it's, it's accept the risk, mitigate the risk, or transfer the risk. And that is a risk conversation. The business will have to sign off on in some form or fashion if you're doing risk management right. And if you're going to mitigate, then you're going to look at implementing certain solutions that protect those risks. And in some cases, you might accept them because they're low enough risk to your business. And to just point that, you know, when, when we did our Christmas show here at the end of mm-hmm. last year, that was a big part of the conversation was we have to understand where our assets are, how critical are those assets? What risk we, are we willing to take? We had to, to assume take? we were inviting a bunch of hackers to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's a risk. <laughs> it is a risk. It is a risk, especially with your Wi-Fi these days. But no, it's, when it's, he changed when the password, running. so it's all good. <laughs> when it's working lately. Yeah, he unplugged it this morning. I'm like, we're down. He plugged it back in. I'm like, we're still down. I thought this was supposed to have failover. <laughs> It's it, you know, I was fine. My computer worked. Yeah, yours know. worked. Nobody, uh, nobody else else's did. Am, am I going to have to fly up there and fix this shit, Paul? Come on. <laughs> yes, now. I would love to <laughs> have you fly up here, Jeff. Yes. Yes, you should come in here. You're, you're picking up on the subtle message there. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> not not really that subtle. No. <laughs> I, I would love nothing more for you to come up here and we get to nerd out and break our network and fix it. Oh, <laughs> we, we have to make a date. Uh, I, there's there's one more piece of the of the of the the security point and that is that the relationship with the customer not just the department of we can help you do it but that we listen to what's important to them understand their mission and so they don't so we they we don't come off as really somebody that's not interested in what they're up to it's otherwise they have no relationship with us and they won't come to us they have to they have to understand that we care and we do care we don't like when bad things happen to the business. That's why we're in security. Well, their, their worlds are changing. They want to do cool shit. The, their, worlds are, their worlds are changing so fast. We had a, in, to this conversation, we had a, a, a meeting last year with, uh, and we, we do a lot of the K-12s in, in the state. So we had the superintendents and principals with their IT directors in the same room. And that was because we were starting to get bad actors that we need that were coming out of classrooms at the age of 15 mm-hmm. because they were taking down their school and they were doing things. Um, and we had to explain to them in a, that, that these students were walking with sledgehammers and smashing their servers to the ground and to give them visuals that they couldn't understand because they're superintendents of schools. They're not, they don't know about this stuff, right? And so the idea of having, you know, FBI and police that are involved yeah. in, in this situation now raises the awareness of, of this, call it the C-suite of schools and things like that. If you want to give those kids community service, they can come work here. There you go. We'll set them on the straight and narrow, get them on the right path to a secure... <laughs> we'll take <laughs> free labor security. any day. That's right. Bring them right here. We'll, there you go. We'll, we'll, no we'll impact take. to my budget. I'm That's all it. good. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I did want to ask one more quick yeah. question. 
taxi sticks, adopted, not adopted, going, what's the future, right? This was all the hype. Um, you know, we heard a lot about it a few years ago. Is it just, is it commonplace now? I haven't tracked it that closely. Are, are these things being used, leveraged? Do they have futures? I'm just curious because that was one of the things on threat intelligence sharing and all these other things. What's going on with that? So JSON is still what people prefer because it's much more lightweight than Taxi. Um, we support Sticks Taxi. We, you know, we have our own uh, Taxi server and we, we format our data in Sticks. And there are a lot of integrations that work that way. And the nice thing is, for the most part, they just work. Um, assuming that the, you know, the, the, the Taxi client on the other end is built to be able to download large amounts of data and so on. Um, uh, but we are definitely seeing a lot of people who have standardized on it. I, I will say it's much more prevalent in the uh, public sector than the private sector. Mm -hmm. When almost any, any any public sector customer we deal with, the first question they ask is, can we get everything in Stix Taxi? Yes, absolutely. In, in the private sector, there are certain vendors, uh, McAfee, Logarithm, uh, and a few others that have adopted um, – uh, sticks taxi fairly heavily and so um, and, and again I like it because it's usually a one-click setup you know you click it and then everything's done and because it's formatted the right way it's fairly easy most most of our customers still prefer to work in JSON though got it because it's much more lightweight it's much more malleable they can write a whole bunch of Python and things on the back end or we're seeing a bigger adoption of uh, SOAR products so Phantom mm -hmm. Demisto and those and, and and they tend to work well with JSON so if, if you're trying to do lightweight pools and push to something else JSON tends to be more effective than got it taxi. Yeah, yeah I mean obviously the the federal government was pushing a lot of yeah. this I can see why McAfee does they have l large federal contracts so being taxi sticks <laughs> compliant is is beneficial to their business i was just curious about everybody else is it the common standard and it sounds like there's still kind of a mix out yeah, there there is absolutely okay. that's interesting oh we need to do alan five questions okay yes. i'm assuming you've heard this on the show before i have okay so you know what these questions are going to be i, I know so what it's they no are. surprise yes. there's no surprise and no. likely you've probably prepared for these questions if they're the usual five questions i have some answers yes Always okay oh my god he's prepared oh he's switch prepared. it up, hey, switch right up. I, i'm a fan i'm sorry that's okay we no, thank you, you for that sorry yeah, for being a fan good. we love it <laughs> yeah right so, so three words to describe yourself goatsy rickroll if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Python. If you were to both the script and the uh, <laughs> snake, and the, yeah, and the snake, yeah, yeah it's, it's silent it's killer. Right. Yeah. I mean. If you were to book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, that one I don't have an answer for. Now, see, um, if you combine answers one and two and add the word killer, that uh, could be your book about yourself. So, so Goatsy, Rick Roll, Python, uh, Killer. Serial Killer. There I you love go. it. Yes, <laughs> that, that's it. That's my... Uh, <laughs> and it's also a song. <laughs> that's, my, uh, that's my hack for, yeah. for, for question three. Uh, so question four, of course, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? So I know this is a popular game in Europe. It is. Um, yes. uh, in the U.S., I'm pretty sure whichever way you go, it's an HR violation. And I figure if you're going to get fired by HR, you should go whole hog, so I'll go first. There you go. Yeah, now part of the Me Too movement. Yeah, right. it doesn't <laughs> matter whether you're first or second. I, I think still whole, hog, whole hog is actually a technique for going first. I hadn't yeah. heard that. That's good to yeah. know. Yep. That was my secret technique. Now that it's now it's out there, I'm sorry. Well, it's the name. secret anymore. That's right. <laughs> Alan, choose two celebrities to be your parents, alive, uh, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Uh, Barbara Gordon and Felicity Smoke. Mm. So Is going Felicity? with Batgirl and uh, um, Oracle. Oh, very nice. Very mm. nice. Wow. Mm. All right. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back, and we're going to talk to Dave from Ocean. So stay tuned.